Awesome. Get it started. Uh, so thanks, everyone, for uh, joining our compliance panel discussion. I know uh, after lunch, compliance uh, and FedRAMP and NIST and all these other acronyms that go along with it are, is one of the most exciting things that we can all agree on, of course. Uh, but nonetheless, as Chris said, I'm Andrew Weiss. Uh, I lead our federal sales engineering efforts uh, here at Docker. We've been doing quite a bit of work with compliance as of late. Uh, but with that, I want to introduce the panel again. Uh, if you want to just quickly introduce yourselves, Susie, starting with sure. you. Sure, Susie Adams. I'm the CTO for Microsoft Federal, and I kind of have a slight frog from the allergies today, so please uh, bear with me if I can't speak. <laughs> awesome, no worries. James? Hey, uh, James Scott um, from 18F, uh, work on cloud.gov there, and also the elite diversity engineer there as well. I'm Greg Ellen. I'm the CEO of GovReady, and I was previously the Chief Data Officer at the Federal Communications Commission, where compliance was uh, a very significant pain. Awesome. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, compliance as a whole uh, with the panel here. We'll talk about the compliance journey uh, and where Docker fits in that process. And we're also going to talk a little bit about uh, how other vendors, such as Microsoft, are contributing to that. Uh, and then we'll close with some of the work that's taking place in the open with uh, compliance as far as a project called Open Control and also highlighting how Docker uh, fits uh, into that. So to start, Greg, I want to uh, point out the uh, challenges that a lot of agencies have today. Uh, and before we start with that, how many folks have gone through the ATO process in this room with any information system? So with all of your hands, how many of you love writing SSP docs? All right, all right, yeah. So we all know how painful the whole ATO process can be. And obviously, there are a lot of great programs out there like FedRAMP uh, and some of the initiatives that they're taking at GSA to help streamline that process. But really, it is a journey. And with that, Greg, tell us a little bit about uh, some of what you've been doing to support uh, the journey that customers have taken or agencies have taken at GovReady through the compliance process. Well, I think uh, at GovReady, we are working really hard to transform that process. Uh, and I guess I would set that up by saying that I think that the shift to infrastructure as code, um, continuous integration, and deployment uh, has provided a very significant and special opportunity relative to both cybersecurity and compliance. That opportunity is if developers and business want to take advantage of the speed that's available from continuous integration and deployment or tools like Docker, et cetera, they have to commit to having automated testing. There's no other way to do it without automated testing. And doing automated testing within the pipeline means that we can make cybersecurity and our compliance paperwork simply part of that pipeline. And, and so, the, so I would say that what we're working on at GovReady is helping uh, boot the ecosystem around making compliance um, really part of continuous integration and deployment. Thanks, Greg. So with that, Greg, could you also yep. touch on a little bit about oh, the, I love this part. Yeah, the FISMA process and how it's kind of evolved? Uh, I'm sure a lot of these acronyms and standards uh, are familiar with many of you in the room. But Greg, tell us a little right. bit more and about And I noticed that some people, that there were many people in the room that did not raise their hand uh, when asked if they've ever been through the authority to operate process. So I'm going to try to describe a little bit about what it's supposed to be like how the creators of FISMA imagined that this uh, world would work, right? So how the people that wrote the NIST Risk Management Framework, and they really imagined that, first of all, people were willing to read 400-page documents, right? That we can embody all of this knowledge and that people would read it. They imagined that everybody in different silos would, of course, work together, that everyone would learn about how to do um, FISMA and how to get through compliance. They imagined that people would answer emails. So if you didn't know somebody, if you didn't know something, people would answer the question. And someone in the organization would not only have the knowledge, but they'd actually tell you that when you asked. Um, and they also, um, if you're familiar with the risk management framework, they imagined it'd be very easy to staff 14 different roles that are involved in the compliance process. Um, they further imagined, as you can see, that security would be part of the plan. And that uh, this is a very important thing, that organizations would actually l treat the risk management framework as guidance. The risk management framework doesn't say, this is how you do compliance. It says, this is how you create a plan to do compliance um, in your organization. But people really don't have the time um, to actually do that. And finally, they really imagine that you'd have engaged leadership at the top of the organization defining what critical risks there were in the organizations. And because we have all these things, we'd magically produce um, the sophisticated plans of how we would maintain compliance um, on each of the different systems. And so that's the idea. Right. 
Now, this is more the reality for those who um, go through the compliance process. Stop me if I'm wrong here. You know, the first reality is that nobody reads anything in the world that we live in. Um, the other thing is that nobody understands each other. Um, you know, and I think that this is, what I have found is that compliance is a world of catch-22s, right? So the people that are really smart, the assessors who understand the FISMA process and what I need to do, they don't know anything about the systems. And the people who know a lot about the systems, the developers, they don't know anything about FISMA. And the security people, they're actually unavailable because they work most of the time behind a locked door. So um, that process is a little bit challenging. Um, leadership who could clearly say what the important assets are tend to delegate because it's cybersecurity. Cybersecurity sounds like something that experts do, so let's um, assign that to the contractors. Now, I do want to point out the risk management framework is a tremendous body of knowledge, and I'm almost through the journey here. It's a tremendous body of knowledge, but it was written in 2003 and 2004 before we had our experiences with the cloud, with infrastructure as code. And if you think back to that time period, it was really common for dev ship cycles to be multi-year, right? That's what we would expect. It, would, it was a multi-year process. So the fact that it took us nine months or 18 months to do compliance and gather the paperwork was not a big deal. But we now live in a world where things move much faster. Now, what I do want to say in wrapping up here about the journey is underlying all of this, there's documentation and there's cross-silo communication. It's a team work. Fundamentally, compliance is not security, right? And if you want to understand how to do compliance faster, embrace the idea that compliance is not security. So what is it? Security is how I make something secure. Compliance is how we as human beings do attestation and verification at scale. Attestation, I attest that I actually did what I was supposed to do. Verification, I have in fact proven or have been tested that I did what I was supposed to do. Compliance is fundamentally about communication. It's fundamentally about scaling. And so what we learn is if we want to automate compliance, it has to be part of our supply chain and part of our automation. And, there, and, that's, and that's where we get to today. It has to be part of the supply chain. Awesome, thanks, Ray. And Susie, uh, just feeding on some of Greg's comments, uh, what have some of been some of your observations in working with agencies and, and working with uh, groups like the PMO and GSA and going through this process and the attestation process and so forth? Sure, I think, you know, I, I, you know, I, think I fundamentally agree uh, with everything you said there. I think, um, you know, as we look at some of the challenges we faced in going through now the FedRAMP process or just looking at the 853 controls, if you look at the controls the way they've been written, even in Rev 4, they're still very prescriptive. Yep about how you actually implement them. Um, and one of the things that we've actually uh, uh, been, been pushing for is to have more of an outcomes-based approach uh, to a control so that people can take advantage of the innovation at the speed of innovation at, at which it's happening today. Because today, for example, you can look at a control and say implement, you should have a firewall implemented, it should have X, Y, Z in it. And when you try to apply that to a software-defined cloud, Right? Even, you know, even today or how about you know, just even a year ago, it was almost impossible to do. We don't have any hardware firewalls. Everything's software defined. Right? So it really do doesn't lend itself to the, to the end outcome, which is, hey, we want to make sure that you're compliance to meet a particular outcome. So what we're, we're really hoping is that you know, over time, as 853 uh, revs again, that it becomes more outcomes based and they actually look at this uh, not just from a compliance, but more of a, you know, what is the outcome of that control that you're hoping that a particular group will do, right? What, what are they trying, what's the risk you're trying to mitigate? And then have the individuals prove that they're mitigating that risk, not by implementing a certain, you know, f physical control or physical set of services uh, that you used to do five years ago, right? Because the pace of innovation is just too fast for that. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure that uh, the federal government is ready for this. Um, you know, I think that it's, it's going to be a challenge um, moving forward, uh, especially when you look at the number of the controls and, and the way that it's written today and the fact that nobody reads 400 pages um, and the fact that they're really just looking at the security assessment report uh, and the third-party outcomes, uh, you know, third-party uh, 
assessments anyhow, um, I think that we are going to need to make some major changes if we're going to allow agencies to take advantage of the cloud more quickly. And, you know, and I do agree that, you know, if you look at how people are implementing things today, that uh, things like open control are a huge step in the right direction uh, to be able to go in that direction. I do think, though, we're going to need to make some changes uh, to 853 first before open control really becomes as successful as we're hoping it will be. Awesome. Thanks, Susie. Greg or James, do you have any other comments that you'd like to add as far as you know, how agencies can adopt new technologies without letting compliance get in the way from that process? Next, I'll wait for the next part. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So <laughs> with that, Susie, uh, could you maybe uh, comment a little bit more about how vendors like Microsoft are uh, approaching compliance and how uh, you're helping agencies get over this hurdle of adopting new technologies like Azure uh, and new versions of Windows and so forth? There's like little bugs flying around up here if you think, you know, I'm like, do you see them? Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm like experiencing like, it's right there again. Uh, um, so if you look at, uh, if you look at some of the challenges just that we faced when we first went through, started going through the FISMA process, we started with Azure in 2010, uh, which ESA is part of the Infrastructure as a Service BPA, and there was no FedRAMP yet. So it was just 800-53, and it was kind of an interesting experience. Uh, to look at the 853 controls and try to apply them to a software-defined cloud and work with many of the software engineers and our compliance and security leads to document this. They were basically uh, like, hell no, we're not doing this. <laughs> this doesn't make any sense at all, right? And, and then even going through the process of, of working through with the assessors, explaining how we're doing things in the cloud, how we manage security, how it's really a big data problem, and I could go on and on and on. Um, that being said, we've made huge strides uh, inside of Microsoft on how we approach this now um, with Azure, specifically Azure. We've actually worked with the FedRAMP PMO uh, in depth to come up with ways to kind of speed this process. For example, you know, we're used to annual, annual cycles of audit. Right? Well, that doesn't really make sense for the cloud. The cloud is not an annual update. Right? The cloud is a continuous up, uh, you know, continually updated. So how do you actually allow your, you know, your federal agencies or your federal customers to take advantage of these new capabilities without having to wait a year? Right? And so we did a lot of work with the FedRAP PMO to show that, you know, hey, you know, we really actually follow process. Right? It's in our DNA to follow this process and roll out code in a prescribed manner. And that prescribed manner, if everybody follows that prescribed manner, then you can assume that everything, you know, because we have this process. So we validated the process, et cetera. Um, now that we, you know, so we have a good process internally. Now, how do our customers take it, you know, how do they take advantage of this? And I think that's one of the biggest challenges we've seen with agencies um, is that when you go and you talk to their, their compliance leads and their, their system, they're like, oh, we have to follow this process, we have to create a system security plan, that system security plan has to follow this template. I have no idea what the customer responsibilities are, right? This is gonna take, you have a 400 page document, this is a year long effort. And so what we've done is actually created something called the Azure Blueprint, um, very similar to something that Amazon's done as well. Uh, we created a Blueprint system security plan that goes in, uh, shows you what those customer control responsibilities are, and then goes one step further and actually uh, gives you guidance on how you might wanna implement them depending on which Azure services you're using, whether they're infrastructure as a service uh, or more of our platform as a service offerings. And we found that you know, as agencies and partners look at this, they're actually able to come up with repeatable processes to go through this, um, which, is, uh, which I think is really helpful. And then being able to automate those in the future would be just huge. Right, to have it kind of be an automated, an automated kind of checklist that they go through and they say, you know, either by looking at the configuration scripts or, or things that people are deploying, to be able to just have that automatically come out, you know, of open control, so you could say, okay, well, these five, I'm going to have to go in there and manually, you know, probably update because they're not, they're not something that we're doing uh, through automation. This is more of a manual process for whatever reason. So we are seeing huge uptick uh, in people now, kind of embracing that concept and understanding control inheritance, which is another uh, piece of this that so you don't have to include. Uh, we've seen agencies try to take the Azure SSP, which is about 400 pages. Uh, take it and just add on to it. And then we're like, well, what are you going to do as we roll up updates to this? And they're like, well, we'll go through that process again and we'll go through a full audit. And I'm like, wow, you're going to go through a full audit like every week. <laughs> you know, at this at piece. So just the control inheritance, I think, was a huge step forward. And again, this is a learning curve. I mean, we didn't, we didn't learn how to build a software-defined cloud in a day. So it's going to take people a little bit of time to figure out, you know, that this is, a, this is different than on-premise. Awesome. Thanks, Susie. 
Yeah, and you bring up some great resources that we doc are actually taking advantage of and giving back to agencies to consume. So things like the Azure Blueprint, which we've adopted for running Docker Enterprise on both Azure and Azure Government, actually shows you all of the inherited controls from Azure and, oh, here are all the components of Docker that help you meet those controls and you just have to fill in those blanks. So we're working really closely with Microsoft in the compliance space to really drive some of those initiatives. Uh, and as a nice segue to the tooling aspect and how we can better uh, you know, meet some of the compliance objectives in our agency. James, uh, would you mind talking a little bit about this initiative that I know we've uh, heard a little bit about earlier in Doug's session, uh, this thing called Open Control and some of the goals behind it, uh, what your role is with it and so forth. Yeah, um, so let me get us a quick poll. Um, has anyone actually like heard of uh, Open Control before today? That's about right, that, that's, 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 that's about right. Um, so, um, open control came from, uh, you know, we started in the 18F with uh, cloud.gov, uh, which is a platform of service that we offer to our partner agencies. And we were thinking about what's the biggest pain point for our partner agencies to get from uh, buying cloud.gov to shipping their product. And the biggest pain point was compliance. So we were thinking about how can we automate compliance in a way that people can actually inherit our controls in a fashion way that, just like Microsoft is always continuously updating, that, we're, that we can also update our platform in a quick amount of time, and they, are, they can ask, also get their updates to documentation in a quick fashion. So we thought, um, let's just create a way to uh, better, increase, or better the way of authoring the documentation. So we created this thing called Compliance Masonry, and from there, we, create these uh, schemas, they're all in YAML, and then from there, uh, you can see right here, actually just on the slides, um, so you see that instead of you actually going down the documentation, that 400 page documentation, which is very, very, it just is really, it's bad for the mind and to look at that every day, <laughs> especially if you're updating your system all the time, you say you just have these things in nice reusable blocks, so you can actually just write out, okay, for this particular component, this is what it, this is what this, this is how the component actually fulfills this control. So um, we, you know, you have, now that you have this, you can create a group of these, you can create what's called a system. You can go for the next slide. Sure. So now you have a system that you can find, and instead of, a, uh, now you have a system, you can actually call in things like the NIST 853 controls, and then from there you can have it target a certain baseline, such as like bad ramp moderate. And then if you're built on the top of another infrastructure like you know, Microsoft, Cloud.gov, whatever, you can actually just inherit those controls as well. And then finally, you can have your fully built out piece of documentation. Now, when we first started this experiment, actually, we were just like, let's just try, try to disrupt the whole ecosystem by just, instead of making a whole, another doc Word document, let's make a website. So uh, with that, uh, we, we tried that, but um, we found out that actually uh, the um, assessors actually um, didn't feel like they, 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 the website met their needs. So we actually re-architected compliance masonry to actually be able to, people can actually write their own tools to hook into compliance masonry to output diff to different formats. And one of those formats would be the Word document that we all know and love. Um, so um, I actually want to go ahead and show a process of actually how we build things. So first, if you take that same YAML, you first can get your documentation by just running the simple git command. Then you can actually then construct uh, any type of exported uh, type of, uh, yeah, exported type of uh, documentation. In this case, it'll be the, the git book that we're gonna show later on. Then once you run that command, it will build everything, and then now you can actually serve your documentation via website. And so notice you, all these commands too are all running within Docker containers. So you can simply mount the component files or pull them in from another system, and it's really easy to deploy. And you can imagine if, as you've heard throughout the day, the way you deploy software in an agile manner through Docker Enterprise Edition and so forth, you can do that same process with your compliance. So your system is always up to date as you update that system, and your documentation always maintains its yeah, can I, I think one of, one of the things that you find out if you've been through the uh, compliance journey a couple of times is um, that very, very frequently 
you come down, it's if you're going to describe how a particular cybersecurity control is implemented, it's going to be implemented in a particular way related to the IT system that's being built or where that IT system is running. So because the control is going to come back to the system, what happens is that sooner or later, the developers of the system are dragged into preparing the system security plan and writing up the controls. That sooner or later, the devs, even though it may not feel like their job, are asked to contribute with how is this control implemented, how does the security work, et cetera. Now, James and I come from a developer background. I think I don't. So do I. So we all come from developer backgrounds, and we're really excited about using Git um, and using GitHub for committing our content. We have some facility, most of us as developers, on the command line. And in the Docker world, is building on this pattern of I push and I pull, and I combine, and I do this from the command line. So it was driving a lot of open control. And why I think it caught on was why can't I build my system security plan and my other certification artifacts the same way that I build my code, right? Why am I writing in a Word document? Why aren't I writing in markup or some other format and storing that in a code repository? And oh, geez, if it's in a code repository, it's right next to my application. So if I change something in my application or my system, I can just change the documentation. And then what James was describing, I could just build the whole thing. right? So what we've discovered is there's a lot of moving pieces. So it takes a couple of times sure. to kind of wrap your head around how to build the documentation from component parts and code. Um, and so it's a little bit confusing to hear it. But what every, but it, but the I, but I think why we're attracted to it is I want to create my SSP the same way that I create my software itself. Well, right? it's true in a DevOps world, right? I mean, that is the developer is responsible, right, and does get interviewed by that third party because they are responsible for that particular piece of the code, and so they are responsible for the documentation. So it kind of does right. make sense, yep. very much so in a DevOps world. Maybe not more so in a traditional world. Right, where you would have different roles that perform that function, but definitely in the DevOps. And it's, uh, a very, and it's a very short leap when you're talking to developers to go from, especially developers that are doing Agile and DevOps, to go from, let's talk about acceptance criteria for this feature, to validation of my security compliance. It's a very short leap to begin to make between acceptance criteria and evidence of compliance. And uh, James, going back to the Open Control Initiative, uh, can you talk about you know some of the visions you have, some of the roadmap with Open Control, and yeah. the open source nature of the project <laughs> itself? So when we first started Open Control, it was uh, we started off with uh, Cloud Foundry, GovReady, and it was just us trying to you know debate what we should do next. Um, we steadily got more traction from other vendors as well, and from there we kind of just uh, the, the ecosystem where it's kind of getting to this, this point where we need to have a better way of getting more input from outside vendors. So I, my first thing would be to actually you know, get the house in order so that people, people can actually get in contact and contribute to a control. So, um, so that's number one. Number two actually would be, uh, there's some bugs. We actually have them all, you know, we have a, uh, everything on GitHub, just ha go through those bugs. And then from there, we wanna have a, a kind of a detailed conversation in terms of what would benefit both the assessors and also the vendors so that the whole flow from developing to generating documentation to accepting documentation is easy for everyone. And then from there, building out a roadmap of, of features so that we can kind of build that into compliance masonry or the whole open control uh, um, community. Um, and as, as you may have heard the, the, the term DevOps Sec Compliance or COMP. So that's, that's kind of like the whole focus of what Open Control is trying to get at, really. DevOps Sec Compliance, all inside your continuous agile development flow. Awesome. Thanks, James. Yeah, and I want to just uh, highlight some of the points James made. 
uh, in that open control is really driven by the community. Uh, and there are multiple vendors that have started to participate in this effort. And I know, Greg, you've been working with GovReady to help drive this going forward. And uh, we've got some things in the pipe to facilitate community events and so forth. Uh, but that really leads us to, you know, uh, what, is, what does this mean for Docker and the container ecosystem? Uh, and really, just like how our uh, primary project, Docker itself, was driven by the community, uh, we want to continue taking that same approach uh, with compliance. And as such, we've made all of our contributions to the open control effort totally out uh, in the open. And all the documentation that you saw James generate uh, is also entirely open source. And even more so, we use the least restrictive license that's available with CCO Universal Public Domain, which means open source and its licenses should not be a hindrance to your compliance process. And we want to make sure that folks that are consuming container platforms can ensure that they're being deployed uh, in a compliant manner. So one of the other things, too, that I want to highlight uh, is uh, where you can find all this content, too, for Docker. Uh, like I said, it's entirely open source, available on GitHub uh, at docker forward slash compliance. Uh, you'll find all the open control formatted uh, content for all of the Docker Enterprise Edition components that make up the stack. Uh, we've done so at uh, against the NIST 853 Rev4 controls at both the FedRAMP moderate and high baselines. Uh, and I also mentioned the Azure Blueprint, which we've made available through partnerships with Microsoft that Susie talked about. Uh, that is also available for consumption as well. Uh, we're also looking to expand upon this. Uh, and this is something we've chatted amongst ourselves uh, between us uh, as how we can actually evolve the whole compliance story. So it's one thing to actually generate documentation, but it's another to actually leverage even other tools to help uh, move beyond just writing documentation or even generating it with tools. So what we started to do was we started to build automation into this where you can actually audit your Docker enterprise stack against the controls from Open Control. So we've started this by open sourcing resources from tooling like Inspec, which allow you to audit your environment. Uh, and we're also uh, building out a roadmap to cover other standards as well, such as DOD 8500.2, ISO, IEC, et cetera. Uh, and also out in the open is uh, a full secure baseline for you to actually uh, build secure compliant platforms. And again, all integrated through the Open Control Initiative. Uh, and one of the other things, too, that I want to highlight, and we do this also with Microsoft's uh, toolkit, is that uh, to go beyond just the general or generation of content, we want to actually provide some sort of intelligence into the way that we build compliance content. So what you're actually seeing here, uh, this is an experimental toolkit that we at Docker have built to actually act as a form of automated proofreading of your content. And what this does is it uses Microsoft's cognitive services to scan the actual narratives defined by NIST. And it compares those narratives with the narratives that one has written themselves, such as a security auditor or from us, Docker. And it analyzes the key phrases and does a match. And it says, here's your score, here's your key phrase match. And what it allows you to do is it allows us to actually do some sort of proofreading for the auditor or the security writer to actually ensure that their content matches the NIST narratives. This is something that we use as part of Open Control for our own compliance efforts, and it's something I highly encourage you all to take a look at for your use. I, I think that this is worth emphasizing. You know, so I'm hungry uh, as a previously as uh, working at the Federal Communication Commission as a as a as a government employee, realizing that the pace of innovation in our organization, how fast we could adopt new tools, was completely determined by how fast we could go through the compliance process for those new tools. And I see someone nodding her head emphatically. Yep. That our pace for the entire innovation at the organization was defined by the pace of compliance. So very, very hungry. What I'm, what I'm savoring, you know, I'm waiting for the, for we're getting closer to this point where I can just go to the GitHub repository that has Docker controls in it. I can use the Azure blueprints and I can just, in the same way that I load a package and it finds all its dependencies, I can load some compliance documentation and it finds all its compliance dependencies and I can generate my documentation um, in the same way that I build my systems through package management and through stuff that's in the repository. So I'm hungry for this day where Docker has already written my control descriptions for me. This is what they're doing with open control. The other thing we get which is really exciting, is if this information, if our compliance information is structured more as machine readable formats, I get to do other things on top of it, like this, 
that I get to actually do language analysis or comparison or other automate or auto or other computation because my compliance information is now closer to being structured data. So this is very, this is exciting. I mean, this is tremendously exciting. Yeah. You know, where we're using the cloud to do, to judge our compliance of what we've deployed in the cloud. For sure. Uh, and we're, we Docker, we're, we're a small company, so for us to get into the space is certainly a challenge. And we viewed open control and the tooling that Microsoft provides and other vendors as uh, almost a godsend for us to actually be able to deploy compliance guidance for folks that have needed it uh, in an agile manner, in a rapid manner, that really match some of our core tenants here at Docker for agility, portability, and control. And so forth. So, uh, so one last thing I'll highlight briefly, and then we'll open the floor for questions while we have a few moments, uh, is that, as you'll hear in the next section, uh, we want to bring you uh, technologies that allow you to streamline your compliance process. And you'll hear more about this in the following sessions around uh, what we're doing at Docker to uh, provide established bases, hardened bases, such that the controls that you would normally have to check off don't even exist because the functionality doesn't exist. So we're doing a lot of work to solidify a base for your Dockerized environments. And again, we'll all be we're providing compliance guidance all out in the open through open control. Uh, and it really helps to streamline that effort, combining with things uh, like Greg talked about uh, and the tooling and the automation that you get. Uh, to really ensure that your compliance process is not a hindrance to adopting new technology. So, so with that, are there any questions for the panel? We have a few minutes left. Uh, I think we've tried to hit on as much compliance content at a high level as we can while applying it uh, to the Docker ecosystem. Sure. There's a mic coming. Mike. Uh, I was um, looking up the Open Control Org website to see, you know, how how much are you guys doing work with other federal agencies? Um, could you give some example on how you're helping other federal agencies in their compliance journey? So with containerization. Yeah. Um, so there is work. There, there are other agencies actually using uh, Open Control to generate their. Uh, documentation. I think Andrew has a great story about that. Okay. Um, but uh, right now, we, ha we still need to do more outreach in terms of uh, how do we actually uh, get more people on board? How do we train people to use open control and compliance make sure to do things? There's still more work to be done to do actually help that. But, but it, as 18F, anyone who uses Cloud Foundry, I'm, yes. I'm sorry, anyone that uses cloud.gov, cloud. right, uh, right, immediately benefits can yes. you describe that? Oh, oh gotcha. yes. So, yeah. uh, um, so right now, uh, you know, since you know we use or we're planning to go back to you actually using Open Control, um, we want to make it so that when you actually deploy your application to cloud.gov, right. you can say I want to inherit from cloud.gov, and then from there, you can actually automatically get all the all the controls that we have taken care of in your documentation automatically, oh, and then from gotcha. there you gotcha. can just so instead of just worry about the smaller set of controls, which are more manageable for you and your team to take care of. Right, 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 right. Okay, got it. So you guys have it implemented within the cloud.gov platform. We've started our journey. So I work for the U.S. Postal Service, and we've started our journey on cloud.gov. We haven't been very active on it, but we're kind of play, playing around, and you know. Yeah. But uh, I, I see great use of this. In fact, I was thinking that as as you guys were saying that you'd compare it with the Microsoft Azure Blueprint. Um, I was thinking that, you know, Postal Service has its own security guidelines, so could we do that kind of crosswalk? I mean, I was wondering what, what, what's the format of the Azure Blueprint that, what, what's the format that you need to do to be able to do that kind of comparison? Well, so, I mean, it, it just depends if you have your own controls. I mean, have you done a crosswalk between your controls and 853 RAV4? We, yeah, so, I mean, that, but that's a manual thing, right? So. But what once else? you, like, for example, we have a spreadsheet that does crosswalks between many different, you know, from between ISO 853 Rev 4, right. uh, you know, D DISA L4, L5, right? Yep. We've done all those crosswalks. So yep. really it really just comes down to right now, ours is just a template. Okay. It is just a word template that just goes through and we actually created it that gives you, that inherits from those controls. Yeah, I, right? I, I, so it's, it's not quite, I mean, you, you kind of have to do the crosswalk yourself. Yeah, the, there's, oh. a re, there's a reality 
you know, we're, we're out here sharing this with you because it is at an early stage right now. We're at a stage where we can represent controls in relationship to the, com to the components that provide those controls, and we can assemble from constituent pieces larger SSPs. And we can, but, but it's, but we need more people involved, but the thing is, is, sorry, let me try that again. So if you are using Docker data center, you can find those controls already written up for you, many of your controls in open control in their repository. If you're using cloud.gov, many of the controls are, for your SSP are already written up, the controls you would inherit in, in 18F's open control repo. We still have to make a connection between this documentation and the automation that defines an Azure environment or an AWS environment. But what we're seeing is these things are getting closer yep. from the blueprint, the, you know, that's going to give you, yeah. you know, that's going to give you the format for deploying a well-configured system, and it's going to give you some documentation to a more automated documentation format. These things are starting to get closer together. They're not there yet. Yep. We're in. We're starting to do this, but we want to all be up here so that you can see that there's just a small bridge that needs to be built sure. between yep. the paperwork and the blueprint. And, and as far as like your postal specific controls, I mean, basically, if you were to start, let's say you were to start with Docker on Azure, there is a Docker on Azure blueprint that lists out, here's your customer controls that you need to implement. Everything else is inherited, yep. right? So you don't have to worry about that. Right, so you, right, worry, right. you would right. worry about your postal specific controls sure. and your customer controls. And that's all you would have to function uh, worry about. Everything else is in that template, okay. already done for you. Yep. Yeah, and we're working to bridge that gap as well. So we're engaged with the mm -hmm. folks putting together the be. Azure Blueprint program yeah. to help bridge that gap between open control and auto generation of documentation. So we're working on it. Okay, shall I start? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so first, uh, I work in a company, we were federal contractors. We were looking at doing something that appears to be virtually op identical to open control. I will try and convince people to stop it immediately. <laughs> uh, there's no point in duplicating effort like this. Uh, congratulations, that's marvelous. This, this is a really good thing. But that's not my question. My question <laughs> has, it has got a security-ish flavor, and I know this is not about security, but I want to approach it from a compliance perspective. There's a, well, I've got a customer, and the customer is aware of a privilege escalation in Docker that is not a small privilege escalation uh, issue. It's the issue of breaking out of the container and into the guest operating system. And I've had technical conversations around that, but from a compliance perspective, you've got live ATOs out there with Docker. How are you handling that issue? How are you describing those kinds of very important mitigations? Yeah, very good question. And you're gonna hear more about that in the next session as well. But what I'll highlight briefly is that uh, we work closely with uh, various security standards that are out there to ensure that as our product is developed, those standards match and we continue to bring those into the compliance world through tooling like Open Control. Uh, so we have things like the CIS benchmark, which is up to date with the latest version of Docker, which talks about here are all the things that you need to configure with Docker, and here's how these things being configured can prevent scenarios like that, and oh, by the way, here's how they get pulled into our compliance documentation because they're all mapped one-to-one. -one. And I also talked about that we're also bringing in uh, new resources that allow you to actually scan your infrastructure we have tooling already to scan against the CIS benchmark. We're also combining that tooling to allow you to scan against both that benchmark, the NIST 800 controls, and any other controls that we develop out in the open. And you can use all of that in concert to ensure that you at least have visibility into the state of your infrastructure for any legacy engines that you have out there, and then any new features that we've introduced to mitigate that risk. I think maybe we have time for one more question. Okay. Uh, with the bad ramp and uh, enterprise edition of Docker, do you have estimation how many uh, NIST 853 controls or how many percent of uh, those controls uh, the, this uh, system is uh, sure. compliant to? 
Yeah, and you can actually use the compliance masonry tooling to actually execute a gap analysis to see how many controls you've filled in, how many controls Docker provides, and how many you might be missing. Uh, but I think we've covered uh, uh, 50 controls roughly for the Docker components because a lot of the controls don't apply. They are inherited from your cloud provider's controls such as like physical security, mobile device security. But we've been able to identify a good chunk of controls that are configurable items within Docker Enterprise Edition or recommendations can that you, we can you, provide. Can you say generally what kind of, which families? Um, uh, mostly uh, controls access follows? control, uh, configuration management, uh, and identity, uh, so IA controls as well. Uh, those and that's pretty problems. standard across yep. the board. Yep. It's mostly all the AC controls. I mean, I think that people are really shooting for my provide my cloud provider is going to take care of a chunk. Then my orchestra, I don't know what would be the right word, my you know, my my distribution or my package layer, yep. Yep. right? Like Docker is going to take care of a big chunk. Yep. Especially around configuration management yep. and access control. And then I'm going to have some common controls that my organization are providing that's coming from our platform, our particular rules. And so I should really be down to you know, 20, 30 controls that are really just relevant to the application or our hybrid controls. But really trying to press as much possible down into those, into those three layers yep. of organization, um, containers, and then platform. Yep. And that's what the open control is trying to make it more apparent to, to help developers see that I am only need to take care of that small chunk of controls. Sure, yeah. So the question was uh, which controls that uh, we haven't defined are the customer's responsibilities. Uh, those are all out in the open source repository. We even have a sample of uh, generating the controls. Uh, we provide the controls where uh, here's how you would configure Docker to meet your organizational requirements, and then here's the controls that you just have to fill in the blank.